Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. This morning, our call to worship is from Psalm 85. It's really a wonder to think of all the generations of believers that have used these words to kind of set the tone of their time together in worship. Beginning with verse 8, reading in Jesus' name, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps.
Our scripture reading today is from John 17, verses 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them. And I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them.
What does it mean these days to be a, a good citizen? You know, we could have a lot of conversation about that as our country is at a time when we're in some pretty deep and sometimes difficult discussions about priorities and loyalties and, and what it means to be a citizen of the country in which most of us who are listening to this today live in. We're not going to talk about that today because we believe there's something even more important to talk about. Not that the other isn't important. But as Christians, we believe that we have been um, welcomed into a kingdom. We don't have a passport, but our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. In fact, the, 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 the gospel writers uh, talked about, well, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and that was, a, that was a, just a real dominant theme uh, in, in, his, in his teaching. The New Testament writers picked up on that uh, as well, as the gospel of Jesus Christ took root in, in communities beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and now was heading towards the ends of the earth and still is, what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, no matter where our geographical location uh, happens to be? We welcome you now to week two of our series, Citizens. Our theme verse is Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul writes, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, as Pastor Doug introduced us to a letter called, called Philippians, it was written to uh, the, the first core of believers in a, in a Greek city called Philippi. Yeah, Greek city was named after the father of Alexander the Great. It had a rich Greek heritage. It was now uh, very much uh, influenced by Roman culture. As uh, in the Roman Empire, the city had been made a, uh, actually a colony of Rome or kind of an outpost of the kingdom. And so there were two very strong cultures which influenced um, the city of Philippi. In fact, uh, even today, some of these influences abide as, as we uh, are reminded often of, of the classic cultures of Roman Greek, Greece, the, the Greco-Roman cultures. And uh, we might notice them in columns at, at, uh, at our government buildings or our college campuses. And, and we're reminded of, of, of those ancient days. But we're going to look at something very different today. It has nothing to do with an earthly government. It has to do with an allegiance to a heavenly kingdom and, and how our identity is so profoundly shaped by what the king has revealed about himself and his calling on our lives. Last week, Pastor Doug reminded us that our home is in heaven, that we are more heavenly minded than, than if we hadn't heard the good news about Jesus. We'll talk more about that as we go farther along into this series. We, we learn that we are, because our citizenship is in heaven, that here we live as resident aliens, so to speak. No matter where our address is on this planet, our primary citizenship is in heaven, but our calling is to be uh, a blessing wherever God has placed us, whether that be uh, in South America, whether that be in China, whether it ha happens to be here in the Red River Valley. We are resident aliens. Our citizenship is in heaven, but we are called to live out our lives as ambassadors of, of the kingdom of heaven wherever God has placed us. And this is a really important time to be reminded of that. Uh, several weeks ago, Pastor Jay Price mentioned uh, to those of us um, who were planning this sermon series, he said, I'm glad that we're talking about our citizenship being in heaven. He said, it seems to me that these days we are discipling people as much by our news feeds and our social media sites as the word of God. Well, today we are going to take that to heart and we're going to focus on what the Word of God says about being citizens of heaven. And uh, it's interesting that when we turn to the Word of God to hear what God has to say, what God has revealed, we turn to a letter. A letter. We, and in fact, the New Testament is a collection of letters, many of them from a very passionate missionary pastor by the name of the Apostle Paul to communities like Philippi, where this letter was first received. And in these letters, we sense a, a, a love, not only for God, that is compelling the Apostle Paul and a desire to do his will, but a beautiful love for the people that he was called to bring the gospel to. 
When God brought the gospel to the Apostle Paul, he changed his life. And that was recorded for us in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 9, as the Apostle Paul was uh, radically converted from being a zealous opponent of the movement that Jesus started to becoming its primary pioneering missionary. God had changed his life. Paul also discovered, though, that as he just shared the good news that changed his life, who Jesus is, what he did for us on the cross, what his resurrection means, and how he's active in the world today, that there were people whose lives were changed, like his life was changed, and some of them were in Philippi. So without further ado, we're going to be talking about uh, the culture of the kingdom of God, and today we'll be focusing on the practice of prayer. I'm going to read for us, beginning with verse 3 of Philippians chapter 1, in Jesus' name. The Apostle Paul, again, is writing to these first century brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers. For all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There are different ways that we could uh, reflect on, on this short part of this letter, but I think it's helpful today to think about that in the kingdom of God, the practice of prayer is profoundly influenced by our understanding of our King. Who are we talking to and what difference does that make? Secondly, as we come to know our King through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, it changes the way that we view one another. And we'll be, we'll be talking about how Paul describes his friends in Philippi because honestly, things haven't changed in terms of the impact of the gospel on our identity and on our relationships. And lastly, what would, uh, what would the Apostle Paul pray for his friends? And we're going to find that what he prays for them is just a timeless um, um, uh, need and blessing for those of us today who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Let's go back and take a look at verses 3 through 6. Uh, we're gonna be, we're gonna, we'll stop at verse 3 where Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Now, um, I'm just going to take a, a moment to, to reflect on, on just the beauty of those two words. My God. My God. Paul refers to the creator of this amazing, beautiful world. Yes, it's broken, but all over we just see reminders of the glory of God. That there's someone greater than any of us that's responsible for this, this, this wonder that we call life. Paul calls him my God. He has a relationship with him. And it's that relationship with God through Jesus Christ that affects how he sees his fellow Christians and what he prays for them. I was reminded of a conversation my daughter had with a good running friend in the community where she was living. Uh, as a young mom, she finds those breaks out, out running to be just very replenishing. Maybe some of you do too. Maybe some of you would think of nothing you'd rather least do than, than go out for a run unless a bear was chasing you. <laughs> but for my daughter, uh, it, it's an important part of her life. Anyway, uh, there are a couple neighbor gals that, uh, that they enjoyed running together. And, and when you run, you have time to talk. And I was so delighted when I when I uh, came to know the significance of the kinds of things they were talking about. They got, to be ta they got to talk about God and their understanding of God. And one of her friends said to my daughter, you know what, I used to be so offended when people would say to me, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'm thinking, I didn't ask you to pray for me. I don't want you to pray for me. And, and for whatever was going on in, in, in that conversation, it, it was not something that was a blessing. In fact, it offended her. 
And as we talked about, my daughter and I, we realized that her, her, her view on life, her view on prayer, had everything to do with her understanding of God. Uh, her friend said that, that, that she understood God much differently than my daughter understood God. Now, I would say that she misunderstood God, and, and there is so much that she has yet to learn about the goodness and glory of God. She would have described herself as having ba basically a pagan outlook on life, where the most important things were the nature around her, and that's where she found her meaning and her identity as, as part of, of nature. Well, we have good news to share, and, I, and I'm glad my daughter was in relationship with, it, with this uh, neighbor friend, and, and we have people around us that have no idea of the goodness and glory of God, but also his personal interest in our lives. Why would Paul refer uh, to, to God as his God? Because God had revealed himself to Paul as his God. God had revealed himself to Paul as the one that loved him so much that he sent his son. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for him. Paul understood that, that, that when Jesus died, that God had taken all of Paul's sins to the grave and dealt with them once and for all thoroughly. That Paul, although he had been a very violent opponent of the movement of Jesus, was fully forgiven by this wonder called grace. And now had given, been given the privilege of sharing the good news for what God had done for us in Jesus. Paul could not think about God without thinking about Jesus. You guys, this is such good news. Because maybe you have questions about God, what he is like, and, and, and maybe some of them are troubling. I just want to invite you to do this. When, when you are wondering about what God is like, just take a good focused look at Jesus. You see, Jesus is how God, when he literally came to us, rather than being transcended somewhere far, far away in heaven, he came to us physically, in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. And he lived among us. And he lived for us. And he revealed to us the kingdom of God, both in his words, which continue to shape our understanding of what it means to be a citizen, but especially in his laying down his life for us. He revealed himself as the in the flesh message word expression of God, a God who loves us in Christ Jesus. So when the Apostle Paul says, <laughs> I thank my God, He's thinking about the God who sent his son to be his savior. All of us are invited to believe that that was for us. And in believing that Jesus died for us and rose again for us and loves us and, and, and the cross of, of Christ is forgiveness for our sins, we can say, my God. If those two words describe anything that is contrary to Jesus these days, you can banish that. Maybe you've been given a distorted image of God through some negative experiences in life. in life. I invite you to move those to the side and focus on what God has done for you in Jesus. That is what God is like. Now, we, you probably sense as we read this letter that, that Paul just flat out loves these people. He really enjoys these people. By the way, that's an expression of how God feels about these people, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. My, my grandpa, on uh, my dad's side, um, his sons, and he, had, and he had four of them, when one of the, uh, his daughter-in-laws would come into the house, we knew he was going to say this within the first minute or so, oh, how's my favorite daughter-in-law? He said that to all of them, depending on who was in the house. But honestly, as we read this letter, and, and Paul wrote to a number of churches, this one kind of feels like, like maybe Philippi was his favorite one. And, and honestly, he loved them all. But the reason we do this is because as Paul talks with them, he talks so tenderly. He talks about this relationship with them as being a source of joy. And he also appreciates the sacrifices that they had made for him and his calling as an as a, uh, evangelist and pastor spreading the good news of Jesus. And, and so we, we sense this right away in this, in this first uh, a few verses here. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy 
because of your partnership uh, from the first day until now and being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What does he mean by a partnership in the gospel? The Greek word here is the word koinonia. And I don't know about you, but when I've heard the word koinonia, it's usually describing kind of the, the warm fellowship that Christians enjoy. Caring for one another, sharing life together, drinking coffee, eating carbohydrates, you know, fellowship. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just kidding about the last part. But there is something really important, and we sense Paul's love for these people. They had enjoyed that kind of fellowship. But there's another aspect of koinonia that is also descriptive of like a business partnership. We're in something with a purpose that's together. And for Paul and the Philippian church, they saw each other as, as partners in the gospel. And so today, one of the ways that we see ourselves as Christians, as citizens of heaven, is certainly people that enjoy friendship and fellowship, but it's friendship and fellowship with a mission. And that is, not, and that is to share the good news of Jesus, but also display the good news of Jesus in our life together. So Paul sees now these fellow Christians, first of all, as partners in the gospel, but he also sees them as fellow projects in the gospel. Did you notice uh, verse six? And you know, if you're like a Bible verse highlighter or underliner, um, I can't imagine reading through this and not hitting on verse six. I love this verse. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You guys, that says that, that these Philippians, you and I, are gospel projects, okay? God is not done. Just as when he saw Peter, the blue collar fisherman, and said, I'm gonna make you into a fisher of men, Jesus said. Jesus saw what he could be and would invest himself over Peter's lifetime, building into him certainly the, the, the core character of Christ. You know, when you come to know Jesus, when, you, when, when, when the gospel comes alive in you as you believe it and receive it by faith and Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. Your salvation actually took place apart from you. God accomplished your salvation when Jesus died on the cross. So when, when you receive the gift, gift of faith, your salvation is not dependent on your maturity, on your passion, on, on your emotions. It's dependent on what God has done for you in Jesus. Now, with that said, there's a lot of work in your life to do, uh, and it's called sanctification. Your identity in Christ is called justification. It's been established. Sanctification is getting used to your justification. Okay, I'm not going to get too complicated here. But you are reckoned as a child of God who stands before God holy like his son Jesus. And you say, well, there's, not a, there's, a, there's a lot of difference between Jesus and me. You're right. One day you'll be in heaven, you'll be glorified, and you'll be just like Jesus. In the meantime, God is working the beauty of Jesus' life, the quality of his character. The Holy Spirit is bringing alive in us what Paul refers to as, at the end as the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. He's still working on us. So you may be a little impatient with where you're at, maybe frustrated, maybe discouraged. Understand, God is, God is at work in you. And, and, and uh, as we go through these times, these bumps in the road, we're invited to remember that we can, we can say to, to our Father, our God, Father, I just would ask that you would help me with this, that I might, that I might relax into what you want to do and that, the, and, and that the, the, the person of Jesus may be at work more and more in my life. So when we get to verses 7 and 8, we, we understand more about this, uh, just this affection we share as Christians. Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ. Now here we see that, that we're, we are gospel uh, partners and we are gospel projects, but what we share in common. And I love the humility of the Apostle Paul here. In fact, it's one of the more beautiful um, witnesses to our, to our relationship with Jesus, and that's our humility. Paul says, you know what? 
I'm, uh, I share God's grace with you guys too. We're all in this because of what Jesus has done for us. It's interesting because we already read about joy and, and that, that word joy or a form of it's gonna bubble up at least 15 more times here. Paul's writing this from prison. He's writing it from prison. He's not defined, his joy is not held captive by his circumstances at this time, honestly. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about how that can be all of our experience in, in the weeks to come, but it's beautiful. Just like Jesus, uh, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Paul saw beyond his circumstances. Pastor Doug uh, taught us last, or uh, told us last week, yeah, he taught us, I guess, that in, during the press of life, because we're citizens of heaven, we can look up. We can look up where our sense of reality once again is completed and focused and, and, and calibrated according to the ways of Jesus. So uh, what, let's just take a quick look at the last section. It's just beautiful. Paul says, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Maybe as you listen to that, man, you mean this Christian life is a lot of God working on me and in me and through me? Absolutely. Absolutely. God is not calling into you a life where he's not fully invested in providing all that you need to live out your identity as his citizen of heaven, as, as a child of God. He loves us more than we could ever know. And, and, and in fact, so much so that over the course of our lifetime, we will go through times when we, when we have kind of just a new sense of the love of God um, as he reveals himself to us in a time of weakness, in a time of, 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 of pressure, even in a time of, of disappointing ourselves and how his grace touches our lives. Paul says that his prayer is that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, he's not talking about about love as kind of a feeling that they work up for one another. Love is, 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 a, is, a, is a description of the relationship with each other that is informed. It knows what God has done for us. It knows the value of life. It knows who we are um, as fellow partners in the gospel as well as gospel projects. And so we love each other thoughtfully. And, and, and as we share this life together, it says that we'd be able to discern what is best. I can't think of anything I would rather have you pray for me today as a Christian. And maybe you can identify with this. Lord, help me discern what is best. I'm in the midst of a time in history. I'm in the midst of, of kind of a cultural change. I'm in the midst of a time when the church is really struggling with how to react to some of the things that are going on around us in the world, in, in, in our culture, in our community. Lord, help me discern. Help me know what is best. You think God loves it when we pray that prayer? He takes us back to, first of all, remembering who we are in Christ and how God has chosen to deal with us. And somehow letting that be the dominant factor and how we relate to one another in this broken world, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus to the glory and praise of God. I'm thinking of that time when, when Jesus was, was walking with his disciples, and I don't know if they were walking by a vineyard. We're told that the temple in Jerusalem had this beautiful carving of, of a vine. And Jesus said to them, you know what, you guys? I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if a person abides in me and I in them, you will bear much fruit. This is to my Father's glory that you bear fruit, fruit that will last. Ah, oh, we, see, we see Jesus' um, beautiful picture come alive here in these words that, that as we, um, as citizens of heaven, uh, we realize that we talk to the King as the one who knows us by name, that we see one another as, as gospel partners and fellow gospel projects. And we desire to bring glory to God as we abide in Jesus and follow his prompts and live according to his word. I hope you're encouraged today and as we continue on in this series, Being Citizens of Heaven, may God bless us not only with the knowledge of who we are in Christ 
as, as his dearly loved children, but the significance that we have these days as citizens of heaven to, to, to bless the place where God has placed us to live. Your will be done, my God and Father, as in heaven, so on earth. My heart is drawn to self-exalting. Help me seek your kingdom first. As Jesus walked, so I shall walk. Held by your same unchanging still my soul oh lift your voice and pray father not my will but yours be done how in that garden he persisted i may never fully know the fearful way was held by him alone. What wondrous faith to bear that cross, to bear my sin. What wondrous love, my hope was sure. When there my Savior prayed, Father, not my Our last word to, today is found in Romans chapter 15, where we read, beginning with verse 5, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. We would love to help you get connected further to Triumph, and there are a few ways that you can do that. We at Triumph value community and relationships and want you to get connected with our church body and experience community and good relationships. 
head over to triumphlbc.org slash connect and fill out our online connection card. If you'd like to meet with one of our staff, we'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and you can select that option there on our online connection card. If you are looking for an in-person worship service, we would love to see you at one of our campuses. At our East Campus in Moorhead, we have in-person services at 9 and 10.30 on Sunday mornings and again at 6 p.m. on Wednesday nights. At our West Campus over in West Fargo, we have Sunday morning services at 9 and 11 a.m. and again Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Thanks for joining us today and join us next week online or in person as we continue our series in the book of Philippians and dive deeper into what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God.